wish with death can happen to people when they least expect it. I feel that I was very unlucky to be in two big disasters, but incredibly lucky to survive both. Just sort of like, okay, I'm hitting power lines, gotta grab onto something before I fall. If I hadn't been singing, people would have been leaving the pub and maybe I'd been leaving myself, and you just don't know what could have happened. It could have been a lot worse. Every year, countless people escape death under the most extraordinary of circumstances. But they're the lucky ones. They live to tell the tale. In 1982, during the Falklands War, I was on board the troop ship Sir Galahad when it was hit by an Argentinian missile. Forty-eight of my fellow Welsh guardsmen were killed and another 97 were injured. I was lucky to survive. 40% of my body suffered severe burns. After years of hospital treatment and skin grafts, I've come through this deeply traumatic experience, a changed person. Whenever we see news footage of disasters, our attention and sympathy is focused upon the people who died in these tragic events and the families who left behind. The impact on the survivors is often overlooked. For one British civil servant, Gary Fellows, the 30th of April 1999 was only the beginning of an ordeal that was to turn his life upside down. Gary was a regular patron at the Admiral Duncan pub in Soho, the heart of London's gay quarter. I was working in Whitehall at the time and I must have finished about five o'clock. I probably got to the Duncan about six o'clock-ish and it was the first real warm, sunny evening of that year. And everyone was outside, pavement cafes, drinking coffee and enjoying the sunshine. So the pub itself was probably a little quieter than normal. There was probably about 20, 30 people in the pub when I first arrived. I bought a bottle of Budweiser and stood at the back of the pub, sort of leaning against the jukebox, which tends to be pretty much my, my normal bolt hole in the place. One by one, all my friends started arriving, and one of my mates introduced me to a friend of his. And I was about to go and get another drink, but I thought, well, no, I better hang on and chat to this guy. It'd be rude to just leave him. Well, that, unbeknown to me at the time, probably saved my life, because while I was chatting to him, uh, the bomb actually exploded. There was a, a big blue flash and everyone kind of ducked a little and um, I, I can remember the, the sound of flying metal uh, hitting the ceiling. And I, I didn't really hear uh, an explosion, just a big blue flash. And the next thing I knew, it was pitch black, thick sulfur smoke everywhere and it was deadly silent. That's one thing that will never leave me, is the fact that you've got all these different sounds, you've got people chatting, you've got people moving around, the jukebox playing, and it all stops in a millionth of a second, all at the same time. I couldn't see where the, the street was. It was just pitch black and I couldn't see which direction to move in, so I just stood there and remember thinking, the smoke's probably gonna kill me because you hear that often people die, not through flames, but through smoke inhalation. And I'm asthmatic as well. So I was thinking, I'm probably not going to make it out of here. And I just might not see my parents again. The next thing I remember was instinct told me to get out. So I, I ended up on the pavement outside. Although Gary got out without any broken bones, many others were severely injured. I checked even before I got out of the pub I looked down to see if I still had two arms and two legs. A crowd had gathered in front of the Duncan. As I staggered out, I can remember seeing them. And at that point, the police were clearing the, the cafes, the bars, the pubs, the shops, just screaming at, at everyone to get out. 
My injuries were very slight. I was very, very lucky. I had cuts and bruises, badly bruised right foot, and a piece of shrapnel sticking out of my left shoe. Three people died and four needed amputations. 26 suffered very serious burns and another 53 were injured by flying glass and nails. Gary's regular spot in the pub undoubtedly saved his life. I thank God I was like standing where I was really. When they reopened the pub, I noticed they'd put it back just about as it used to be. And I still lean against the jukebox. So a creature of habit, I suppose. The very next day, police arrested a 24-year-old man who admitted holding a grudge against the gay community. David Copeland was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment. After the, the trial, I felt that um, that's kind of a form of closure and we can really start to move on now. And I, I pretty much did. I started thinking about it an awful lot less after that. Remarkably, Gary Fellows escaped almost unhurt from the Admiral Duncan bombing. But by a bizarre twist of fate, he was to face yet another more harrowing experience. I could see the carriage up ahead turning over, knowing that we would be next. In April of 99, a bomb destroyed the Admiral Duncan pub in Soho, killing three and injuring another 70. Gary Fellows was incredibly lucky to escape almost unhurt. But a year and a half later, on the 17th of October 2000, he boarded a train at London's King's Cross to Peterborough to pay his father a surprise visit. Just 30 minutes later, his train was to pass through Hatfield Station. A few minutes after pulling out of London, the ticket collector came along and I said, is the buffet open yet? And he said, yeah, it should be. So I thought, I'll go and get a cup of tea. So I was walking through the train and carried on into the buffet car. And at that moment, there was a loud bang underneath the train and started shaking about violently. And I, I thought straight away, we've come off the rails. It started filling up immediately with a very thick dust from the, the ballast in between the rails. And the actual dust in, in the carriage reminded me of the smoke in the Duncan. And I can remember thinking, oh, not again. The buffet car continued moving despite the wheels coming off the rail. I could see the carriage up ahead turning over, knowing that we would be next. As the carriage began to turn over, Gary grabbed the nearest handrail. If I hadn't managed to get my hand around the rail, I would have been killed, I would have just minced me up. It was only when the train ground to a halt that Gary realised he hadn't escaped serious injury this time. I looked down and my Timberland boot was swinging loose. And I thought, I've bust my leg, I think the bone's come through, and my foot may be about to drop off. And I was really surprised my first reaction to that was, well, if the people that lost limbs in the Duncan can carry on, then so can I. He was also trapped under debris. He couldn't move. All he could do was wait for help. Gary, how are you going? Oh, how's it going? Oh, yeah, it's yeah. Paul well, Bromwich and his well. crew yeah. from the St Albans yeah. Fire yeah. Station yeah. was yeah. one of the She's first to be the called out to the disaster. The rescue team arrived at the scene within 15 minutes. We went through round, checking for casualties and so forth, and uh, looked along into the buffet car, and right at the very end in the lobby where the two carriages uh, join, there was Gary with another fireman who had got their previous moments before, and a paramedic. So we, um, I climbed through to assist. The rescue began despite the scene still being unstable. I can remember thinking, we've got to get out. We don't know what's going to happen. Have all the trains been stopped? Are we going to get hit by another train? Is there going to be a fire? There was a danger of fire, being the, the buffet carriage, but um, the crew had already um, seen to that. But Gary's injuries made it difficult for the firemen to remove him quickly from the carriage. He had severe shock and he had um, quite a severe lower leg injury, which had to be immobilised. We then manipulated him onto the immobilising stretcher and slid him out through the length of the carriage to the open end and uh, to trackside then to the ambulance, which was a good three quarters of a mile away. It was quite a way to carry him. As we neared the ambulance, one of the firemen 
said to me, oh, there'll be some tasty nurses uh, at the hospital, mate. And, and I said, well, I'm quite happy with the company I'm in, thanks a lot. <laughs> we joked with him when uh, we'd found out that he'd been in the pub bombing and uh, also this. I asked him um, if he wouldn't mind doing my lottery numbers for me. Gary was lucky to survive as the four passengers who tragically lost their lives were in the buffet car with him. Ironically, after surviving a nail bomb blast, his broken ankle was fixed with a surgical pin. In total, he spent three weeks in hospital recovering from the physical injuries he received in the crash. After the Hatfield disaster, Gary Fellows sought the help of a counsellor. Post-traumatic stress can live with disaster victims long after the physical injuries have healed. I feel that I was very unlucky to be in two big disasters, but incredibly lucky to survive both. I'm still here at the end of the day, and there are people that aren't. I never forget them. Gary couldn't have expected to have been in two disasters in his normal life. Skydiving is certainly not an everyday activity. The sport could be seen to be caught in danger. While others do it as a thrilling but safe pursuit. When you first start skydiving, it's almost like uh, the feeling you have like when you're in a car accident, your heart's pumping just faster than you can ever imagine. You know, it's almost hard to see, it's, you, know, you can't walk. It's just so much energy, just an overwhelming, just sensory overload. 29-year-old American Peter Conrad is an experienced skydiver and instructor from Denver, Colorado. He's made some 200 jumps, but none of these could have prepared him for the events that were to unfold on the 15th of June, 2002. Skydiving is a safe sport for all the right proportions are taken. Peter had been through this careful routine many times. Yeah, it was just my 227th skydive. It was no big deal. It was just another time that I was jumping with my friends. Are you declaring an emergency, sir? Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download daily now. But on that day, the conditions were not entirely normal. Bushfires were raging in the local area, and World War II slurry bombers were called in to dump tons of water on the flames. Every time you turned on the TV, it was uh, you know something about you know, another fire spread or another fire was contained. But as the fires were many miles away from their jump zone, the skydivers' preparations went ahead. It was absolutely standard. It was got ready, got in the plane. It's just another uh, another day with my friends. We were looking forward to it, just like every other jump. Knew we were going to go out and have a good time. My friend and I, we uh, exited the plane, you know, about 12,000 feet over the ground. It's incredibly noisy. You're falling at the ground, so, you know, there's, there's some things to, to be concerned about. As usual, they filmed their jumps with cameras strapped to their helmets. We had ended up getting a little separated towards the middle of the skydive, got some distance, some horizontal separation between us. My friend and I, you know, kind of broke off a little earlier, and I was uh, just kind of watching my little wrist altimeter that told me how high it was. Meanwhile, a slurry bomber pilot was returning from the fire zone to collect more water. He took the most direct route. Yeah, I was just about at 3,000 feet, just, you know, reaching to pull, and I heard a plane fly under me. Straight into their jump zone. Almost instinctively, I had to lift up my feet to miss the plane. It's not something that you prepare for or can even imagine, so just my instinctive response was, you know, I just, you know, looked off to the left. And then to see a, you know, huge four-engine bomber flying away from you that you just missed by, you know, 10 or 15 feet, it's, yeah, it definitely opens your eyes. The 15-ton bomber was so close that if Peter had jumped a split second earlier, he would have been directly in the aircraft's path. Reeling from his near miss, he then almost forgot the most important procedure. I was still on my belly and still falling at 120 miles to the earth. My brain is processing this information about what just happened and I was still falling at the ground, and it took about three seconds to realize that yeah, I still have to do something about this. You know, I still have to open my parachute. So I ended up landing. I just remember yelling, just some, some words. 
People on the ground saw it, they just couldn't believe that I missed it. The footage from the camcorder strapped to Peter's helmet confirmed how close he came to the slurry bomber. When we watched the video, I don't think anyone realized exactly how close I was. Yeah, when I saw it, I saw in each frame the wing getting closer and closer. Everyone that watched it, you know, they agreed that it was about 10 to 15 feet away. Peter was lucky. Skydiving claims 61 lives every year. Surprisingly, most of these are due to human error rather than parachutes failing to open. Despite his near miss, Peter continues to skydive, but he will never forget the jump that could have been his last. Yeah, it just makes you realize uh, how, uh, yeah, how delicate you know, life is. It doesn't take more than 0 0.03 seconds of separation between life and death. You know, I can't imagine that in the future I'll ever come closer to dying and you know, get away from it. Australia is a tourist mecca for around about half a million young backpackers every year. Keith O'Brien from Wigan had given up his job to go and explore the vast wildernesses of the outback. Like thousands before him, he stayed in one of those basic hostels that populate small rural communities. It was a hostel that was to make headlines around the world. After seeing the big Australian cities like Sydney and Melbourne, the 21-year-old realised that he had spent nearly all his money. Desperately needed work by this stage. Funds were very low, very, very low. Didn't particularly want to ring up home at this stage either. Thought I was going to do it on my own. So ended up just going to Childers. This heritage town in North Queensland is a regular stop off for cash-strapped backpackers. Here they can fund their travels fruit picking. It was just something different to do. I'm, I'm never going to do it ever again. As soon as I got there, there was work for me the next day, which I was quite happy with. As Keith needed cheap accommodation, he chose the Palace Backpackers Hostel as his temporary home. He soon formed a close bond with fellow travellers. Everyone sort of just binded, because we were all in the same boat, you know. So we just sort of made light of it, you know, had a laugh as we did it. It was superb. We'd come back in from work and it'd be rushed for the showers. We'd all eat tea together, we'd all cook together, we all lived, we all drank together. It, it, we were like one big family. However, one hostel resident was different from the rest. 37-year-old Robert Long was not a traveller. He was the local drifter and misfit. Robert Long, as a person, was very strange. He had a room, he had a bed. He tended to sleep on a couch in the lounge. Uh, he was a bully to some degree. He didn't particularly like backpackers. Keith had been there for six weeks and was planning to leave on his 22nd birthday. My birthday present is I'm going to get myself out of Childers, I'm going to go back to Sydney, I'm going to start working again where my friends were. A few days work, extra work come up, so I thought, well, a little bit of extra money in my pocket won't do any harm. And uh, ended up, you know, ended up staying a little bit longer. The hostel decided to hold a birthday party in his honour. The young backpackers revelled late into the night. We were still celebrating my birthday, which is only the day before, because we had so much left over. It was brilliant. Gradually, everyone flaked off one by one, went to the rooms here all early for work. And uh, that was it. That was the last thing I remember, just hitting the sack. Australian police have removed the last two bodies from the hostel where 15 backpackers perished in a fire. The man suspected of starting the blaze has been spotted in the area. Louisa Baldini reports. Robert Long, a 37-year-old loner, was seen near a fire in a rubbish bin in the hostel just hours before it went up in flames. Keith's misgivings about Robert Long were justified. Just after midnight, the loner deliberately started a fire in the downstairs TV room. Within 15 minutes, the fire engulfed the 100-year-old timber building. Upstairs, Keith was in a shared room with a fellow British backpacker. There was a lot of commotion, smashing of windows, people screaming, people banging on doors, and then it sort of dawned on me. I looked around and you see a bit of smoke coming under the door. Just realised the severity of this was, it was, it was huge. I woke my uh, roommate up, Kelly, shook her, come on, Kelly, you know, hostel's on fire, we have to get out. The fire spread quickly to the first floor, blocking the only escape routes. 
There were bars on the windows, vertical, horizontal, gaps in them, not big, maybe a foot and a half by a foot, not big at all. So, because I'd originally seen the flames at the other end of the building, I thought we'd be okay. I thought, we'll just walk out, walk around a few corners and we'll be out. But as soon as we walked out of that room, you couldn't see your hand touching your face. Unfortunately for the residents, the smoke alarms hadn't activated. We had to go sort of towards the fire to get out. Panic sets in. And I thought, we'll have to go through the windows now in the room, we'll have to go back in the room, we'll be safer that way now. We managed to get back into the bedroom to go through the window. Obviously, I didn't think it was the safest option because they'd gone that way the first time, but uh, we didn't have much choice. If I couldn't get out, at least Kelly could get out. Kelly, very petite woman, very. As I put through the window, some people outside pulled her through. Now Keith was faced with a terrible realisation. He might not be able to get through the bars himself. I'm not the smallest of people. I managed to get my head through and a shoulder and got pulled through. The gap's a foot and a half by a foot. Not very big at all. Not very big at all. How I got through, I'll never know. A few minutes more and he could have perished. And we all congregated on the front of the hostel. And it was a sight that I'll never forget. I mean, I think about it every single day. What people don't really understand is that you're looking for these people. You know, it's like a second family. You're looking for people and you can't see them. 15 of the 84 young backpackers suffered terrible deaths. Tragically, bodies were found slumped in piles under the barred windows. A lot of people have paid daily, 15 people, but it's not just those 15 people that have paid, it's their families, their friends, the friends of the families of the friends, their aunties, their uncles, us, my friends, my family, they've all, they've all felt it, they've seen us. You know, that shouldn't have had to happen. Robert Long is now serving 20 years for arson and murder. This is little consolation to those left grieving. Keith returned to Childers a year later for a memorial service. Being reminded of the details of the fire brought home how lucky he was to escape. I was, I've been told by firefighters after the fire that I should be clinically dead, the amount of time that we spent in the smoke. So, whatever you believe, so somebody was looking after me that night. It's always going to be with me. It doesn't go away, you just learn how to deal with it. 15 people, 15 young people die. I'm such a waste of life, people who didn't deserve to die. You know, they were prime in life, they were, they were living life to the full, and that's why we've got to live it to the full now. There's no doubt fire is a terrifying and unpredictable hazard, but the weather too can sometimes be just as life-threatening. We know there's going to be bad weather because we've seen it on the, on the reports, you know, but nothing, nothing like what materialised. With over 19 million flights a year worldwide, there are on average just 10 passenger airline crashes. Despite this statistically making air travel the safest form of transport, many of us have a misplaced fear of flying. However, for one British couple, their anxiety turned into a nasty reality on a short flight to Europe. In September of 1999, newlyweds Bill and Trixie Tams were looking forward to holidaying in Spain. Although they were not experienced travellers, the flight was a short one. It was three years ago last September, and my wife and I thought it would be a good idea to incorporate a holiday with visiting friends. Well, Billy wanted to go to see his friends because they've got bars in Spain. And he wanted to go and visit them over there. Even so, Trixie had her reservations about flying. The day before we were going to leave, I just really didn't want to go. I felt like it's a bit sort of... Not apprehensive, what's the word? I don't know, it's, it's a bit of a strange feeling, you know, sort of depressed. Overcoming her anxiety, she boarded the plane with her husband at Cardiff Airport. We got onto the plane, everything was normal, we took off, we are flying over there. We, we knew there was going to be bad weather because we'd seen it on the, on the reports, you know. But nothing, nothing like what materialised. They tried to relax and enjoy their flight, but an hour later they hit bad weather. We started to hit some bad turbulence, you know, and we just thought, oh, it's a storm. But 
but um, Trix was a bit worried about it because you could see lightning outside and you know, don't normally see that sort of thing. I remember the lightning as we were approaching Spain and I was thinking, oh my goodness me, you know, and then we had a lot of turbulence and I was thinking, oh my. Bill tried to keep Trixie calm, but she became increasingly nervous as the turbulence buffeted the plane. And I was actually gripping onto the seat and I, I said to Bill, we're going to crash, we're going to crash. And he said, no, no, we're going to be on the jovial person he is. And, you know, he said, no, it's going to be... I said, I'm telling you, this plane is going to crash. And she kept saying, I don't like this, I don't like this. I kept saying, well, all right, kid, don't worry, you know, having a bit of a laugh about it, you know. Despite Bill's light-heartedness, the situation took a turn for the worse. The plane flew into a torrential rainstorm just outside Girona Airport. And then the pilot told us to fasten our seat belts, so and so forth, and that's the last thing he said to us. The pilot gave up an attempt to land the plane the first time, as the winds were too strong. I don't think that we can fault that pilot, because he did literally do everything according to the rule book. The only trouble was things within seconds changed. On the second attempt, he was blinded by a bank of cloud. This took him by surprise, and it might have taken any pilot by surprise, however experienced. The pilot decided to attempt the landing anyway, despite being buffeted around. It went down like to about 5,000 feet, as it was shown on the monitor, and then it went down to 2,000 feet. I think, oh, you know, we're going to be landing soon, but it's very rocky it was. And all of a sudden the plane started to go up again. And this happened a couple of times, this, 5,000, 2,000. 5,000, 2,000. It had a very heavy landing, bounced on its main wheels, and then came down very, very violently on its nose wheel. But it was it was a strange quietness, you know. It wasn't a lot, it wasn't a, hardly any panic there. It went dark, and um, it sort of took off a bit again, and it sort of landed with one great big thud. There would have been a terrific noise because the aircraft was scraping along the runway on its nose. And I said to my husband, this is it. We're going to die. And, excuse me. All of a sudden, the aircraft then veers off the runway onto rough ground. I grabbed Trix because she was holding onto the front of the um, headrest in front of her. I've got my arm around her and we're shaking about. It hits a large bank and bounces over the top of it. It bounced so high that it actually almost got airborne again. It seemed to be taking like for hours, but even though it was only like minutes. It hit the ground again very hard and then went down a bank. And then we just had this crack. And it was at that point the aircraft broke into three pieces. Um, it split into three pieces. The front half was a middle section and a rear part. The rear part that we were in had tilted like we were like that. Although the plane had come to a rest a few hundred metres from the runway, the drama was far from over. We could smell this aviation fluid, and I was panicking then, any minute now it's going to blow up. You know, Trish saying, we've got to get off, get it off. With no sign of help from the emergency services, the passengers decided to take action and escape the potential death trap. As I jumped out, I think I was going, we just landed in this mud. It was just like soft, wet mud. And I landed actually on this boggy field up to my knees in mud. And then I fell actually flat on my stomach and he, he sort of dragged me along the field. I started to piggyback tricks because this mud was knee deep in this field. I was uh, trying to wade out of it with her on my back was too much for me. So in the end I had to drag her across the mud as far away as I could. It was a surreal situation because it's like you're in a dream. It's not really happening. You know, and it was so scary, and all I could see were all these people, loads and loads of people trying to get away from this aircraft. The passengers ran in fear, not knowing if the fuel tanks were about to explode. In the back of my mind, this plane's going to go up. You know, we would have been fried alive because we're only 100 yards from it. It was a terrifying situation to be in, terrifying. Despite taking Trixie a safe distance from the aircraft, Bill returned to help other people struggling to get off the plane. By now, the rain was helping to dampen down the wreckage. My husband went back to the plane to help people get off the plane, which scared me, because I thought the plane was going to blow up. 
I said, just stay here and I'll come back to you. Don't go anywhere. And I, I couldn't wait for him to come back because I was just so worried about him. It's quite romantic because I'm shouting out, Trixie, Trixie, and there's all this rain coming down. And I was calling his name to find amongst all these people. I could hear Billy, Billy, and they imagine there's 240 to 300 people there and we're trying to find each other. And, and I couldn't find him. Eventually he did come back and I was relieved about that. Remarkably, due to a power failure, the control tower was unaware that the plane was lying only a few hundred yards from the runway. We're all stood there, what's happening? You know, there's no ambulances, there's no fire brigade. We're expecting the helicopter to come over searching for us. It took them an hour and three quarters to get to us. Despite the fuselage having snapped in three places, everyone survived the devastation. All 245 passengers on board escaped without any broken bones. They were all put up in a hotel to recover, but the trauma of the near miss affected Bill and Trixie profoundly. I thought I was going to die. I thought I was gone, and I couldn't understand then afterwards why I didn't I? And I felt guilty in a strange way that I didn't die. I was trying to be strong for Trix for the first three or four days, and um, one day I flipped. I just like got up and I, I cleared off to Barcelona for the day. I got up at like five in the morning and just cleared off and she, she didn't know where I'd gone. This prompted Bill to seek help from a counsellor provided by Britannia Airlines. He tried to tell me you haven't got to think if this and if that, you know, just think you're here now. You know, don't think, oh, if the plane had caught fire, if we hadn't got out of it, you know, if it had done this, if it had done that. Even in this day and age when safety is integral to plane design, 100% survival rate after a crash like this is exceptional. Whatever goes wrong cannot go as wrong as what happened on that day. I always think, well, you was wiped out that day and you had a second chance. We did live, you know, and we're very lucky to have a second chance. And so you have to make the best of everything you've got now, every minute of it. Few of us give second thought to driving every day. Many of us feel safer in this environment than we do in trains or in the air. But driving is the most hazardous form of transport. In 2001, road accidents were responsible for causing nearly 38,000 casualties and over 3,000 deaths in the UK. In the US, where the car is considered a necessity rather than a luxury, there are 110 fatal accidents every day. In January of 2003 in Blue Springs, Missouri, USA, a simple car crash triggered one of the strangest events the town had ever witnessed. There's nothing to really compare a car like that to. I've seen cars in the trees, I've seen cars sideways on trees, I've never seen an occupant actually thrown out and up into the power lines, and we're talking 30 to 40 feet off the ground. Any way you look at it, you just don't see that. 18-year-old Joe Thompson, your average American teenager, was on his way back from his aunt's house in his Jeep. I was headed home, and there was a guy next to me, and he cut me off. When he cut me off, I swore to miss him. And he hit the back of my car. And my car spun and started rolling. Now on to an amazing story of survival. An 18-year-old Blue Springs man gets ejected from his Jeep and lands on some power lines. I hear this big, loud crash, and I see this guy flying through the air. I'm like, what the heck just happened? The first roll tore off the top of the Jeep, and somewhere between the first and the fifth roll, I was catapulted out of the Jeep. 35 feet in the air. This guy's grabbing on that every wire he can, trying to hold on. As Joe was flung out of his car, remarkably, he grabbed hold of the power lines above him. I didn't see him, and he clipped the front end of my vehicle, and I heard a loud crash, and I looked up, and I saw his Jeep tumbling. The first thing that happened was the guy jumped out of his car looking around for me, and he's like, well, where are you at? And I heard him say, turn the car off, and I, I couldn't see anybody. And I said, where are you? And he said, look up, and I looked up, and he was hanging from the power lines. And then just stood there dumbfounded, just looking at me like. Returning to the scene, Joe recalls the moment it happened. My Jeep was sitting right there. I was thrown up above those wires, hit one of the top wires, fell through onto the middle wire. The power line on the bottom was wrapped around my leg and wrapped around the line at the same time. Gradually, a crowd gathered to stare at this astounding spectacle. 
one of the ladies looked up and told me, you know, well, I called 911, the emergency crew's coming, and I just looked down at her and said, what good are cop cars gonna do me? Give me a fire truck. Firefighters David Doherty and Brian Moody were about to witness an event unique in their careers. We were dispatched on an emergency medical call, a motor vehicle accident, and we were ready for everything because we were thinking the worst before we got there. Well, at first, we didn't really know that the, he, the gentleman himself was in the power lines. We thought the vehicle was in the power lines. You get calls like that from time to time. We started rolling up, and we saw a, a, a person in the power line and uh, he was moving and it, it just kind of hit us in awe. You know, I'd never seen anything like that before in my 13 years. A combination of luck and survival instincts had left Joe alive, but in imminent danger. Thousands of volts were pulsing through the electrical wires he was holding on to. It was just sort of like, okay, I'm hitting power lines, gotta grab onto something before I fall. Because if you fall, it's gonna hurt. Initially, the firefighters were unable to help in case they earthed the power cables. There are four power lines up there. Three of them were at 7,200 volts. You know, I mean, what are you gonna think? The guy's in real trouble. Since they were dealing with electricity, they didn't want to get too close because the electricity could arc from the power lines onto the ladder and kill everyone on the truck. We're just telling him to hang on, that we were trying to get the power company there, make sure the lines weren't charged. I was worried about, obviously, him being up there and hanging like he was hanging. I didn't know how long he could hang that, hang that way. And that's why we set the ladder truck up underneath Joe, just in case he did fall. He wouldn't fall the full 25 feet. On the inside, I was thinking, oh, man, what if I fall? But there's no reason for me to panic because God was in control of the situation. You know, I just turned to God in that situation. I mean, there's nowhere else to turn. <laughs> While I'm hanging on the power line, the only place I can look is up. And so that's why I did. I, Looked up. Again, his life was in his own hands. Whenever the fireman asked me how long I could hang on for, I told him I can hang on as long as it takes. And he just sort of chuckled at that. But uh, I was getting tired. <laughs> he did want to get down, and he was uh, he lost feeling down in his waist. And I think that was primarily from just hanging up there. The power line was going through the inside of my elbows, and so it was cutting off the circulation to my arms. I was starting to get uh, pins and needles, except for pins and needles, they felt like daggers. <laughs> for about a millisecond, it crossed my mind to let go. And then the realization popped into my head that there's no way. <laughs> there's no way. If I let go, I'm toast. You know, I'm going to be flatter than a pancake when I hit that ground. After 20 minutes, the power was turned off. The fireman finally rescued Joe. Three of us got up there, put a cervical collar to stabilize his neck, got the wire uh, wrapped out around his foot. We had to spin him in the wires in order to get him down to untangle his legs, so we turned him over about three times in the wires to get the two wires parted and get his leg out from in between them. And we secured him to the long spine board and carried him down the ladder. Um, it, was, it was a different rescue. <laughs> I came down, and they're like, do you know how long you were up there? I said, I guess eight minutes. And they said, no, you're up there about 20 minutes. And when they told me that, I was just like dumbfounded. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> there were no words to describe it. I was just like in awe. He was pretty, pretty calm considering what he'd just been through. It was amazing to look at his uh, vehicle that he was in, that he didn't get injured down there before he ever even got up into the power lines. It, to, to get through that part was a pretty amazing thing because it really destroyed his vehicle. He was uh, just glad to be alive, and he stated that several times. Such was the seriousness of the crash, Joe was airlifted to hospital. Television news of his predicament had already reached his local pastor, who set off to hospital expecting the worst. We raced off towards the hospital. Uh, you know, obviously um, couldn't imagine what it is we were going to find, just hoped he was alive. His fears were unfounded. Joe Bailey had a scratch on him. Throughout the entire time of the hospital, probably three doctors came in. First one came in, checked me out, walked out shaking his head. Couldn't believe it. Because what the doctors were seeing was a kid that just got out of a totally traumatizing accident with a few bumps, a few bruises. You could see that they had slashed his jeans in order to tend to his terrible wounds. And uh, to their amazement, had found nothing and released him. And uh, this was just a miracle that's conspicuous to the point of being comical. The odds against Joe surviving unhurt were astonishing.
From the beginning of the accident to the end of the accident, there were so many injuries that he could have sustained. If you were looking at an emergency medical textbook, he could have probably made it through every chapter. Joe was very lucky. There's no such thing as luck. The entire thing is miraculous. I'm just glad to be alive, so I really don't dwell on the past on what could have happened, because it didn't. Sometimes, being in the wrong place at the wrong time can change the course of our lives forever. Terrorism by its nature is indiscriminate, and it can strike at ordinary people in everyday situations. You don't actually think that it's going to happen to you, or where you're drinking, or where you're working. In this post-September the 11th world, the chances of being involved in a terrorist incident have increased. For the British public, living with terrorism has been a reality for the past 20 years. Like many suburban areas of London, Ealing Broadway has a thriving high street with restaurants, late night bars and pubs. On the 2nd of August 2001, the popular townhouse pub was holding a special karaoke competition. <laughs> 21-year-old law student Danielle Nelson went along especially to take part. My mum actually heard about it. Somebody had said to her that there was a film crew going to the townhouse and they were filming the karaoke in there. So me and my friends and my mum went down there for the evening and had a really good time. There was lots of people that had come in, lots of friends. It was very, very exciting. You know, lots of people wanted to get in, in front of the camera and do their stuff on the karaoke. Although the townhouse had an extended licence, the security team was strict about enforcing its midnight curfew. I knew it was late and I knew it was getting to closing time. I was getting pressure from the bouncers to actually end the evening as soon as possible. They like normally to end slightly before or on the dot on, on midnight. Danielle was one of them people that, when she sings, everyone listens to her. So, as it was a you know a special occasion, I had a word with the bouncers and said, "Listen, we've got a girl here who's really good." So that was the reason that we kept going a couple of minutes after midnight. While the singing continued. Outside on the street, no one noticed the grey Saab that had been parked on double yellow lines, not far from the pub's entrance. Over a hundred people gathered around to hear Danielle singing one last song. It was now a minute or so past midnight. As I was singing, I think I got about three or four lines into the song. We suddenly heard a big bang. Danielle immediately looked towards the window. I saw the, the light from the explosion and then I heard it. I don't think I realised what was going on and just thought to myself, well, the, the show must go on and try to carry on singing. Saab contained an IRA bomb which had been detonated to devastating effect. You felt the pub shake and the windows came in. And although it was only for a couple of seconds or maybe just a split second, you did feel the vibrations and the earth literally did move. It seemed like a, a kind of cinema screen because you had the windows and just as you would watch a kind of DVD surround sound movie, you kind of saw these flames all coming directly towards you, very, very lifelike. And it was quite a scary experience. I don't think I'll ever forget that. The whole pub, after a few seconds of being in awe of what was happening, realised, and that's when the panic broke out. The next thing that I remember is someone saying on the mic that everybody to stay in and get away from the windows. I thought, OK, I've got the microphone. It's really up to me to kind of tell people how to, how to deal with this. OK, once again, can you please step away from the window? Away from the window! The supervisors then opened up a fire exit that was a little further up towards Ealing Broadway tube station and we started to kind of guide people out that entrance. Okay, can you please start following the gentleman signaling over here, please? Okay, can you please start following the gentleman signaling Scenes of chaos and panic greeted the pub goers. Everybody just started leaving through the fire exit. 
I think they just wanted to get out of the building. People were running in all directions. They were running towards it, away from it. Remarkably, only seven people were admitted to Ealing Hospital. No one was killed. The bomb detonated after most of the revellers from the other bars had dispersed, except for the townhouse. If it weren't for the last song, the pub would have been closed on time and hundreds of people would have been on the street, within metres of the car that was packed with 40 kilograms of explosives. Now I look back on that and see how serious it was, it really makes me uh, kind of appreciate the fact that we did get out of that one alive and I think it will always stay with me for the rest of my life. You just don't realise how lucky you are sometimes and how close you can come to being hurt, especially the size of the bomb and they knew that it was there for a reason, that it was intended to, to kill people and maim people. Surviving the horrific trauma itself is only the beginning of a much longer process. For me, it was a physical as well as a mental rehabilitation. For others, it is like being given a second chance. You got a second chance with your life, so do something about it. Every day after that was just a bonus day. But the sooner you realise that you're a survivor and not a victim, the sooner you'll be able to put the traumatic experience behind you.